Welcome to our broadcast today. On behalf of Native Christians, my name is Pastor Dan Rautenberg, and I'm excited to welcome you to our broadcast today. We've got a lot of wonderful things that Jesus wants to share with us from his word, and we're glad that you're here. Let's begin with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for keeping us through the night from all harm and danger. Thank you for bringing us to this new day, a day full of your mercy and grace, for a day for forgiveness of sins, a day for a new Christian life, and a day to grow in our faith. And we ask that you help us to do that today. Send your spirit into our hearts. Help us to understand the things you want to share with us. and Help us to put them into practice in our Christian walk. We thank you, Father, for putting us on this Christian path, the only path that leads to eternal life with you in heaven. We thank you, Jesus, for opening that door for us, for putting us on that path and walking step by step with us all the way. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for opening our hearts and our minds, for putting faith in our hearts to believe this, to follow Jesus all the way to heaven. We ask that you continue to bless us and our families and our communities today. Help us to grow from our time in the Word together in this broadcast. Help us to walk and live our lives for you on that path that leads to heaven. Jesus, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, glad to be here with you today. Glad to be sharing God's Word with you today. In our sermon series, we've been talking about what it means to be a disciple, to follow Jesus. That's what a disciple is a follower of Jesus. And today, as we as we take a look at our, our theme for today, we talk about how disciples who are following Jesus, walking on the way to heaven, also train other people to walk. If you're on the path, if you're walking on the path, take someone with you. Walk with them. And there is a joy in that, a very, very deep joy in that. That's what John is going to remind us of today, and uh, and we're going to take a look at that in our broadcast. So if you have your Bible at home, the text for today is from 3 John. That's one of the letters of John, not the gospel, but one of the letters in the very, very back of your New Testament, almost at the end. Uh, 3 John, very short letter. Uh, we're going to be concentrating especially on the first eight verses. So if you have a Bible at home, 3 John, the first eight verses. Uh, there are no chapters. It's a very short book. So verses one to eight. We'll read that for you today, and maybe you'll want to read the whole letter after our broadcast is finished. Here it is, First John, or 3 John, verse one. The elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitalities to such people so that we may work together for the truth. This is the word of our God. Let me start this morning by, by asking you, brothers and sisters in Christ, have you ever seen someone take their first steps? Now, you probably don't remember your first steps. I don't remember mine. Certainly, it was a long time ago, and it's something now that, unfortunately, we take for granted, being able to walk, being able to run, until that day comes when we have trouble walking and running anymore. But maybe you're a grandparent or a parent, or maybe you're an auntie or an uncle. Maybe you're someone who's been able to see someone in your family take their first steps. And if you ever have, it's a wonderful thing. I've got to, gotten to see it four times with my own children. And it's a wonderful thing every time it happens, isn't it? 
You see this tiny baby come into the world totally helpless, totally dependent upon the adults to do everything. The baby can't eat by itself, can't keep itself warm by putting on clothing by itself. A baby can't go anywhere by itself. You put it down and and he or she, you know, the, the baby is just there, can't move, can't even roll over. And as a parent, maybe you try that. Uh, you you put your children down on their on their tummy tummy time right so they try to strengthen their their core muscles and learn how to to sit up and and you put them on their back and they're just there uh, but then then they get stronger don't they and they learn how to roll over and then they start learning how to crawl and after they start learning how to crawl they start. They start learning how to pull themselves up on things. Their muscles start getting stronger. And they're learning how to do these things simply by watching you. The adults around them, they're watching. Kids are so smart when they're babies. They're so smart. They're absorbing all this information just like a sponge. And they're watching you, watching you, watching you, watching you as you move around. And that's what they want to do too. And just by watching you, they learn how to, to crawl and then to pull themselves up and then to stand. And then they're ready for their very first steps. And you're there, right? And you're cheering them on. And, and maybe you're, you're, you're kneeling a few feet away from them across the room and you're cheering them on to take their first steps. Come to mama, come to daddy, come to, to auntie, come to grandma, you know, you're, you're, you're cheering them on as they take their first steps, and there it is. It finally comes. Maybe someone's right there with their camera. They want to film this. They want to send it to all the relatives because they're so proud watching that baby finally take its first wobbly steps. This is the, the natural way of how things work, right? Even if you can't remember yours, <laughs> um, you did it, and... If you watch someone else, it's such a joy, right? And this is how it goes. We grow up. And just like somebody cheered us on to take our first steps, pretty soon we're the ones cheering someone else on to take their first steps. Life goes forward. The same principle applies in our church. The same principle applies in our Christian walk. Maybe there was someone there cheering for you when, when you took your first steps of faith. Maybe it was as a little baby or a child when a, when a parent brought you to be baptized in a church. When mom and dad or grandpa and grandma or auntie or uncle, someone in your family or even one of your friends brought you to church, went to church with you. They did the hard work of caring for you, praying for you making sure that you had a place to hear about Jesus. Maybe someone read Bible stories to you when you grew up, or maybe it was in the Sunday school classroom or a summer camp or whatever it was. There were people who wanted to share the gospel with you, and they were cheering for you. So were the angels. Did you know that? The angels cheer when someone takes their first steps in the Christian faith. And we see that someone showed their Christian walk to us at some time in our life. That's why you're listening to this broadcast. Someone shared the good news about Jesus Christ with you. And now we're the ones. We took our first steps in the Christian faith. Maybe it was recently or maybe it was years and years and years ago. But now we're the ones who also want to watch someone else take their first steps in the Christian faith. And there is no better feeling for a Christian, says John in our text for today, than to see the people you know and love and care about so very much walking in their Christian faith. This is what John writes about in our text. He starts out the elder, that's John, and he's writing to his dear friend Gaius, whom he loves in the truth. 
He says, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. This is John, and John is the elder. He's an old man when he's writing this, you might say. And as we've been talking about in our sermon studies from these letters of John, most of John's family and friends from his younger days were gone. You remember John was one of the original 12 disciples, and all of them were gone. They died for the faith at younger ages, we might say. John was the only one left, and the only family he had left was his spiritual family, you might say, his Christian family, the people he had preached to about Jesus. John had served as a pastor in several different congregations, traveling from one church to another, preaching the gospel, and watching people grow up in the faith. These people were his family. The people he had he had preached to, the people he had taught, the people who had learned about Jesus from him and had become Christians. They were John's family, his spiritual children. And one of them was a man named Gaius. He was a dear friend. And John loved him like his own son, like his own child in the faith. John writes to his son in the faith. And reminds him, I'm praying for you, Gaius. I'm praying for you. Praying that his health was good. Praying that things were going well with him. And he was writing because he couldn't be there in person. He was separated from his Christian family. But he always cared about them. He never forgot his family in the faith. And finally, there was good news. Some of the believers from that congregation had come to John to visit, and they had given him the great news. I'm sure that John was asking about his friends and all the people that he knew there, and he asked about Gaius, and he got great news. Gaius was remaining faithful to Jesus, remaining faithful to the truth, faithful to God's word. And not only was he talking the talk, he was walking the walk, you might say, the Christian walk. Maybe John was there to see Gaius' first wobbly steps in the faith. But now he was overjoyed to hear that Gaius was stronger and growing, and he was continuing to walk on that path. He was continuing to walk on the Christian path, walking more strongly, living a Christian life. There was no greater joy for John than to hear this. This is what was precious to John. Remember, he was an old man at this point. And as he neared the end of his life, what's important to you? It's not your money. It's not your stuff. It's not your fame. It's not your, your, your job. It's not your position. It's none of those things. The only thing that matters to you when you get older are the people you care about. Because those are the only things you can take to heaven with you. None of that other stuff goes to heaven with you. It stops. You don't take your money to heaven or your things to heaven or your stuff. Only people. It's the only thing you can carry past the grave to eternity. This was what was important to John. And he was thrilled to hear that Gaius was walking with him. So how was Gaius walking his Christian walk? Well, how we, we see how he was serving the Lord. This is the report that John got. In verse 5, it says, Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. What a joy it was for John to hear that Gaius had become a leader in his church. Not only was he supporting it generously, he was also supporting the spread of the gospel to more places. 
See, in those days, the gospel was growing and spreading very rapidly. There weren't very many Christians around. And missionaries were going out, sharing God's word, starting churches wherever they could go. And some of those traveling missionaries had stopped in the city where Gaius lived. And you know what Gaius did? He not only supported his local congregation, but he was also taking in these traveling preachers and teachers, these missionaries who were going to other places. He was hosting them in his home, feeding them, taking care of them, and supporting them in the work that they were doing. And when it was time for them to go, he sent them on their way. And John encourages that. Keep doing that, Gaius. Maybe he was giving them food for the journey or money to, to keep going. But he was supporting them in many ways. And he was encouraging other people to do the same. Everyone else in the church was noticing this. They were encouraged and inspired by what Gaius was doing to walk his Christian walk and to support his congregation and share the gospel. That's how it works, friends. Gospel preachers don't get support from pagans, as John points out in the text. <laughs> in fact, the pagans are the ones who are usually trying to run them out of town to take their jobs, to take away their income, to take away their means of support to stir up people against them. They aren't going to support the work of the gospel. It's Christians who support the work of the gospel. And those gospel preachers had to depend upon the people who were hearing their message to take care of them. They were strangers to Gaius, but it didn't matter. He welcomed them. He provided for them. And he was a good influence on other people to do the same. John taught Gaius how to walk, watched him take his first wobbly steps in the faith, and now Gaius was not only walking, Gaius was teaching other people to walk, teaching other people to walk their Christian walk. This is what disciples do. They teach others how to walk in the faith. This is how the gospel is passed on. This is how the good news about Jesus spreads, how the rooms of heaven are filled. It's the mission of every Christian and the mission of every Christian church. Now we know why. We know why. There's something even more important in this life than learning how to move around or walk physically with your two legs. Walking your Christian walk is even more important. Walking your Christian walk is the difference between life and death, literally. The life and death of every individual Christian, the life and death of every Christian church, life and death for eternity. This is the great battle that's always raging. God wants the rooms of heaven filled more people in his family, more people to be saved. And Satan wants the exact opposite. Satan wants to drag everyone down with him into eternal death and torment in hell. There's no middle ground. It's one or the other. And Satan is fighting hard. Whether you wanted to fight or not isn't your choice. You're in it whether you wanted to be here or not. If Satan succeeds, he breaks the chain. If you've ever thought of it like links in a chain, that's how we are from generation to generation, to pass things down. We pass things down from grandparent to parent, from parent to child. And we grow up and we keep that, that link, that chain growing. But what Satan wants to do is to break that chain. He wants to have it so that grandpa and grandma might be in heaven, but children and grandchildren after them might not be. And if that happens in enough families, then the community also is robbed of its church. It won't stay open if there aren't enough people to support it. If no one supports the work of the gospel, if no one cares enough about that life and death mission, then the gospel moves on. We hear that described in many other places in the Bible. 
And in some of our churches, we're reading some of those other readings that go along with this sermon. We hear about it often. Jesus himself told his disciples this. When you go into a town, if someone receives you, they'll take care of you. Don't take anything with you. Just rely on the people there to receive you and take care of you. And the Christians will take care of you. And if no one in that town wants to hear about the gospel and is willing to support you, then move on. Move on. That's how it works. And this happens, unfortunately, way too often. It's the story of this sinful world. The gospel is there and it flourishes and it grows for a time, but then too many people throw it away. It moves on. It's been moving around this world for centuries, friends, for centuries. The question is how long it will stay where we're at. One of Satan's best tricks is to make us think of our spiritual life in a church as something more like a store to shop at. Like I go there if I need something, and I take what I need and then I go. And if some other store offers something that I think is better or a better deal, I'll just go there. We call that a consumer mentality. When you think of your church or your faith as a store to shop at, and if it gives you what you're looking for, then great, you take what you want and then you leave. So you might show up once in a while whenever you're in trouble or whenever you need something, but then you don't show up for long periods of time, or you just go to somewhere else if they offer you a better deal. That kind of mentality, I only use church to use it for me to shop when I need something. If you look at church that way, if enough people look at their church that way, it won't stay open. Too often we fall into that trap of thinking that, well, somebody else will just keep the church open. Someone else will give an offering. Someone else will be there to worship. Someone else will make sure that it's open. And if you're looking for someone else, someone else isn't there. And the day comes when it's not there. So many churches have closed because of that kind of mentality. That's what happens when Satan breaks the chain. Grandpa and grandma once attended faithfully, and they're probably in heaven, but that faith was not passed on. Someone threw it away. And the chain is broken. Every new generation has to learn how to walk. And every new generation has to pass it on to the generation coming after them. They have to teach other Christians how to walk. The church isn't just a building for someone else to keep open. It's people. Christian faith is passed on by people. This is part of the Christian faith, right, friends? This is the heart of Christian, what it means to be a Christian and walk that Christian walk. You stay on that path, and you are asking other people to join you on that path. Now, Satan wins a lot. He does, unfortunately. Christians fall away. Families that used to be faithful no longer are. Churches that used to be open no longer are. Places that used to have the gospel no longer have it. Satan wins a lot, but you know what? He's not stronger than Jesus. And if you're worshiping in a church today, or if you're listening to this broadcast, you're here because somebody taught you how to stand and how to walk. That's why you're here. Friends, someone loved you. We're listening or watching this broadcast because there was someone in our life that cared about us. And by the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of that gospel message that was given to us, it brought faith, didn't it? You wouldn't be here if you didn't have that. You wouldn't be here if someone hadn't done that for you. To watch you take your first steps in the faith. They wanted you. 
to have that joy, the same joy that they did of knowing Jesus Christ. They wanted you to know that Jesus Christ is the one who forgives sins. They wanted you to have the ending of your story changed from a bad ending without Jesus to a happy ending with Jesus. They received hope and they wanted you to have hope real hope from Jesus. They became a part of a Christian family, just like John. They had their lives changed. They had the confidence of going to heaven when they died, and they wanted to give it to you. Someone passed the gospel on, friends, to you and to me. Someone told us about the incredible love of God and the incredible things that Jesus has done, that he gave his life for us, that he died so we could live. And we follow Jesus. We follow Jesus willingly in that joy. Someone shared that joy with us. Someone brought that gospel to us. Someone who was walking their Christian walk, finding a way to share the gospel message, brought it to us, and the Holy Spirit did his work. And now, friends, we are those disciples. It's time for us to walk our Christian walk, and it's time for us to help someone else take their first steps. Our goal is the same as John's to spread the gospel, and I pray that our joy is the same as John's, to see somebody like Gaius take his first steps in the faith, and then to hear the overjoying news that he's continuing to walk his Christian walk, that he's growing, and not only is he growing, he's teaching other people to walk, he's inspiring other Christians to walk. That's our goal, just like John's in our text to take people out of the claws of Satan and save them from eternal life. That's what God did for us, and we want that joy to be, uh, to be given to others as well. I pray for you today. If you're watching or listening to this broadcast, I pray for you to walk your Christian walk. And I pray that God also gives you that same joy that he gave to John. When you can see somebody take their first wobbly steps in the Christian faith, and then you watch them grow. And maybe it's your children, your own children, or your own grandchildren by blood, or maybe it's your children by faith, your spiritual family. Wherever they may be, friends, however you can share the gospel, whatever you can do, do your part. And may God give you joy in that. Friends, uh, God has given you different gifts. I don't know all of you. I don't know what gifts he has given you, but he has given you gifts and talents and resources. If he's giving you money, use it to share the gospel. If he's giving you time, use it to share the gospel. If he's given you the ability to pray, pray. Pray. And keep praying. He's given you the ability to preach, to teach, whatever he's given you. How can God use you? That's up to you to find out and then serve him. Use those gifts and talents and resources to teach others to walk. Show them what a beautiful Christian life looks like and cheer them on. Watch them grow. Amen. Yeah, God bless you. Amen.